Hi, Tom. Thanks for joining the Western Canon Podcast. My pleasure, Jordan. Thank you very much. So I'm really excited to have you uh, on the show. I've been listening to you for years. And one of the things I love about the Tom Woods show is that you range from current political events uh, to deep issues of libertarian philosophy to, you know, making it as a podcaster and, and those sorts of things. You talk about, you know, what are the best avenues for homeschooling your kids and, uh, you know, you really come at discussing freedom from all angles. I want to start briefly with your background. Uh, you have a pretty much a non-traditional background, given that you are kind of an academic type. Uh, you're a historian, a New York Times bestselling author, podcast host, uh, and, and I would say sort of a firebrand libertarian. Uh, but you aren't a tenured professor. Your path uh, to reaching the public has been self-reliant. Right, uh, and you talk about that a lot in your show. Um, I wanted to ask about your background. Um, you know, how did you get to where you are now? Uh, where did you get your education, uh, Tom? And how did you end up in the position that that you're in as a as an influential commentator, uh, as an author, as a podcast host? Well, I have some fairly elite credentials, yet I I've sometimes thought to myself that it would be a nice goal to make these elite universities rue the day <laughs> they let me, <laughs> uh, you know, boast of of, uh, of uh, you know have, holding a degree from those places. So I do have a an undergraduate degree from Harvard in history and several degrees in history from Columbia University. So my educational background is is in the Ivy League, and I will say that although the vast bulk of people who taught me were on the left. I mean, maybe I'm generalizing too much, but in my experience at the Ivy League level, there is still a sense that if you do good work, you get rewarded. Now, that's not to say I would ever be appointed to a chair at Harvard, but there, there were serious people there. Like my dissertation director, Alan Brinkley, whose father was the newsman David Brinkley, was an expert on American conservatism. So we had plenty to talk about, and we disagreed, but it was an interesting conversation, and we respected each other. And I, I, what I'm describing to you sounds like it's from another galaxy. <laughs> the people with different views were able to sit down and have, have pleasant conversations, but I, I invited uh, numerous professors out to lunch and uh, chatted with them in their office hours. There, there was a bit of conformity, let's say, on campus, but absolutely nothing like it is today. Right. I, I just dread setting foot on a college campus. That's these days. right. But so, so you're right. I, I, I so I, I did go this path. I did dip my toe into academia briefly, but then when I got a position as a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, and I spent four years there, I realized, well, I actually rather like the the job where I wake up in the morning and I do whatever I want to do. I right. basically work on whatever I want to work on. This is absurd. And on my way to the office, I would drive by people who were doing roofing in 100-degree Alabama heat and say, this is not something to take lightly or to fail to appreciate. Right. But what, what got me on my current path was in 2010, for family reasons, we wound up relocating. And I thought, well, that's okay. I can work from anywhere, and I'll just freelance in terms of writing and speaking. But my gosh, I mean, eventually we wound up with five children, and, and just writing and speaking is a pretty precarious existence for a father in that position. That's right. So I began doing a little online teaching and stuff like that. But I realized that in writing the books I had written, and at this point I've written a dozen of them, I had built up an audience that enjoyed content of mine. And somebody advised me that if they like your books, maybe they would like to see you teach. Maybe you could teach history courses. So I started to do that online. I built my own platform for that. And I taught the way I build it was the history and economics they didn't teach you. <laughs> and suddenly I had a lot of people banging down my door to enroll in that. And I and that's now seven years ago that I launched that thing. 2012 was when I launched that thing. And then I started working on the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum, which is a K through 12 program that kind of supplements what I've been doing for adult enrichment for adults. And that has been great. It's a self-taught curriculum. I promote that. And 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 following up on that, I realized that I I got pretty good promoting that thing. Mm -hmm. And and I realized, you know, I can promote. I'm just good at promoting. Period. I mean, if there's something that's worthwhile that will help my folks, I'm pretty good at promoting it. So, for example, on my podcast, I do have some sponsors, and I have sponsors who've been with me for years. And you would think by now, all my listeners have made their decision. They're either going to buy this razor or they're not. Right. But it's that. 
I'm just good at it. I guess that's <laughs> something I didn't realize before. And so now I'm in a position where because I am pretty good as a marketer and I have you know, built up some pretty decent entrepreneurial instincts, I get to interview people every single weekday whom I find interesting and I promote things that I believe in deeply that I, that I think will help my folks like the Ron Paul curriculum. And I get to more or less make my own hours. Sometimes they're Sometimes they could be long hours depending on what I'm working on, but I, I can work from anywhere. If I just decide, you know, I need to get out of town for a few days, I can pack up my computer and go. That's right. It doesn't matter. No, I yeah. don't have to say, get anybody's permission, you know, hey, may I please do this? So that is not a position I would want to give up no matter what was offered to me in academia. I just wouldn't want to do it because not only that, I have a much, much bigger audience than I would ever have in academia. Much, much bigger. True, true. And I imagine that allows you to be more of a purist however, than someone in academia would, would uh, be capable of. I wanted to ask you about your, your brand of libertarianism. I've been listening to your show for a while, and so I kind of know. But for my listeners, um, I, I wanted to ask you about you know, the type of libertarian you are. As a libertarian myself, I come into contact with many different varieties of libertarianism based on whatever I'm listening to. Some that don't seem very much like libertarianism at all, right? Often these are like left-wing types that for some reason want to say they're libertarian, uh, uh, you know, but uh, really they're just left-wing. Uh, and even kind of the right-wing interventionist types who are afraid to admit that they are conservatives or uh, neocons or whatever. Uh, and so they cling on to the libertarian label. And then there are different strains of libertarian thought. There's Cato and there's Mises, um, small L libertarians and, and anarcho-capitalists, right? There are a bunch of different strains. Lay out your f philosophy for my listeners. Um, how would you describe your, your worldview, Tom? Well, I'll say two things, the first of which will be less controversial among libertarians. And the first thing is when I started studying economics and then eventually I moved on to the so-called Austrian school, what impressed me about it was that and I realize it's not fashionable to say this, it is self-regulating. It shows how society operates without a central voice directing it, without, I call it the bullhorn theory of society, that things don't get done unless somebody with a bullhorn is barking out orders of people. <clears throat> and yet you have this amazing international division of labor with no central coordination churning out products at, at just the right pace. So there are, there's no surplus, there are no shortages, and all this is coordinated across an international span with people who probably can't stand the sight of each other, for all I know. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow this amazing cornucopia results. That, that demands explanation. That demands gratitude. It demands wonder. It should prompt these things in us. And when you try to intervene in it, you think you're going to improve it, you know, because you're – we're smart people. Surely we can produce a better outcome than people operating at random, but you can't, it turns right. out. And it's, it's, it's hubris even to try. So that gives me this inclination to say, let, you know, let people interact with each other freely, and that gives us the best result. The other side of this is where I sometimes come up against uh, uh, opposition among, among other libertarians. And the nice thing is these other libertarians and I don't talk to each other, so it never <laughs> – doesn't really bother me <laughs> at all. But, and, and it's not even that I'm unwilling to speak to people who disagree with me. The, the funny thing is I get people saying on my show, they'll sometimes people will say to me, my listeners, um, you know, you should interview people who aren't just libertarians. So, okay, so I'll bring a diverse array of people on and they'll say, hey, those people aren't libertarians. I can't satisfy you people, right? So I'm quite willing to talk to folks. But, but the other thing is my view is that the state – I think a lot of people who think of themselves as conservative or on the right, they think of the state as being a guarantor of order and the state as a guarantor of social order and that uh, you know we need the state to crack down on X, Y, or Z. And I think to the contrary, that for at least the past couple of hundred years, the state is the source of disorder. Mm -hmm. not, not the only source, but it's a source. It's an institutional source, and it's a source that everybody from kindergarten on up is taught to revere and trust. And that's very dangerous. So I believe if your view is, look, I'm, I'm conservative. I believe in what Russell Kirk called the permanent things. Mm -hmm. I just want what's best for my family. I, I, I believe in – I have very traditional beliefs on a wide array of, of topics. Then the state is not ever in the modern world. It's not ever going to be your friend. Maybe temporarily you can get some legislation that slightly helps the family 3%. 
But after that, the state will be back to its war on everything you believe in. And so my view is that instead of saying, well, we'll capture the reins of it, we'll show them, is to try to work toward a society where we regulate uh, the, the social order, let's say, um, just through the normal operation of civil society, non-coercively, and try to think that way because I think it's a, it's a devil's bargain to try to be working with an institution that when you have people who hate your guts in charge of it, can really, really make your life miserable, borderline impossible. Right. So, so is your um, libertarianism informed by human nature, by the fact that uh, human beings, when they are in charge of anything, are, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely and that sort of thing? Are you a believer in subsidiarity? I am. I mean, subsidiarity taken to the nth degree. Now, I know folks on your who, who listen to you, they'd be insulted if I defined what subsidiarity is, but I'm going to anyway you should, at the, yeah. risk, the risk of insulting them because that's a word that doesn't get used often enough. The idea behind it, and I guess it, I mean, really, you can see it going back into the Middle Ages, but in the 20th century, it did get a little bit of extra uh, attention. The idea is that we don't simply assign to a faraway institution the care of a particular task unless we've first exhausted all local possibilities. Right. So, so we begin first with the family and then with the local neighborhood and then maybe the local parish or civic groups or s some, some kind of a fraternal organization. And then, you know, then at the extreme, you know, at, this is an extremely difficult problem, maybe the county. <laughs> and then if it's unthinkable, then we go to the state level. Mm -hmm. And then if it's just, you know, so in other words, you, it's, it's a series of levels. And we don't delegate to a higher level of society unless all other options have been exhausted. And it's my view that they're never exhausted. They're right. basically never. It's just right. automatically assumed. Well, of course, Hillary Clinton and 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 uh, Lindsey Graham need to tell us about how our school should operate or <laughs> what our university should be teaching. And I, I think that's got the way society should run exactly backwards. That's right. And so power should be nested at the lowest levels possible. Does that start with the individual? Is the lowest rung the individual and then the family and then the county and then the state and then the, you know, the federal government? And should the federal government just be worrying about protecting our individual natural rights? Well, even there, the, uh, there are some libertarians who would say that we want a federal government whose court system is going to look out for individual liberty and intervene where necessary around the country to enforce that. I tend to think that that too is too top down. That if, if, in, if we have a, a government of any kind at any level, then we want the most local level to be the first one we look right. to when it comes to the protection of individual rights. Because it sounds, it sounds saccharine and benign. Oh, look, we're just here to protect your individual rights. We don't in any way intend to uh, criminalize behavior or speech. Uh, we're not here to, to, to cast a pall over free speech or free thought or how you run your business. But as long as we're here, maybe we will. I, I would rather not put that, that nose in that particular tent. Do you think that that's what's happening with Brexit, is the idea that, that uh, the European Union, which claims to uh, respect subsidiarity, is that sort of the problem, is that power is centralized far away? in such a way that uh, Britain can't make its own laws. Right. I mean, that is the problem. And, of course, they may say that they believe in subsidiarity, but a lot of people say a lot of things. I mean, when you looked at the, the Soviet Constitution, that made an awful lot of promises <laughs> that were the exact yeah. opposite of Soviet life. Mm -hmm. So when I see this controversy over Brexit, I, I understand people who are simply technocrats in the way they look at the world, saying, well, there might be some mild inconveniences uh, if they're with Brexit, because then we're not part of this this uh, common economy as much anymore, and so I might need more documentation when I travel around, or there are different taxes I might be subject to. I, I sort of I see that, but to think that you would be again when I hear somebody saying I need we need to remain, I'm totally against Brexit. This is the end of the world. What I hear them saying is I don't want us making our own decisions. I'm not smart enough for that. I need you, smarty pants people telling us what we should be doing, that, that just seems like beneath the dignity of a free people to put yourself in that position. Do you think that a, a lot of the uh, sort of attempts to centralize everything um, and sort of ignore subsidiarity have to do with the misunderstanding of rights? Do you think that it, 
that people don't realize what rights are, if you want to think about it in the context of positive versus negative rights, is one of the problems is that we we think that positive rights here in the United States at this point, maybe it's a, a civics education problem, we think that positive rights are actually natural rights, which they aren't. I, I think certainly this fuels centralization because the language of rights is very compelling to us, especially as Americans. The language of rights, I have a right to this, uh, and, and you have a right to that, and my rights are being violated. So when that language gets used, we sit up and take notice. And the trouble is, as you say, if you just promiscuously use the language of rights, you lead to all kinds of confusion. And the language of rights, which was intended to protect us against government overreach, can then be used as empowering the government. Because, of course, if you have a right to, well, a laundry list of, of goods, well, how are you, how is that going to happen unless the state is involved? Whereas at least it's at least conceivable that your right to your life, your right to your property, your right to life, uh, to, to liberty, these things could conceivably, you could at least imagine how they could work just with plain old civil society. Because my right to life really means, it doesn't mean I have a right to a kidney dialysis machine. Right. It really means I have a right not to be killed by you. That's right. My right to property doesn't mean you're obligated to give, give me property. Right. It means the property I have, I have a right not to have it stolen. So these are really negative, so-called negative rights. Right. And now that's that's one thing. And I can imagine how we could arrange that. But if you're going to say to me that you have a right to a Cadillac, how could that happen in civil society? Because at least I could imagine, my, you know, we all have a right to property. You enjoying your property, me enjoying my property, and it works. But if you have a right to a Cadillac, well, so do I. So <laughs> now how is that going to be enforced? Are we going to both go over to the Cadillac dealership and just steal them from the guy? In which case, where's his right to a Cadillac? Right. How does that come into play? Right. Th these don't even make sense. They can't even be enforced consistently because if I were, if you and I were on a desert island and I tried to enforce my right to a Cadillac against you, what would that consist of? Me enslaving you, forcing you to make a Cadillac yes. for me. Yes. So there's no way that can be a natural right. The idea of nature is that it's constant across place and time. Right. But if that right can't be enforced on a desert island or it couldn't be enforced 500 years ago, then it's not natural. Then right. it's invented by somebody. And it's probably uh, some scheme to empower the state further because the state then has to intervene. That's why the state loves the idea of equality because equality, which in some, in some, sem in some semblances can be an okay idea, right? Mm -hmm. We all are equal before the law. Or, you know, equality we're all, of rights. Yeah, that's right. We're all equally entitled uh, to be free from uh, interference by other people. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But that word, there's something captivating about it. Then it can be used to mean, well, everybody has an equal right to this or that or an equal right to and, – and before you know it, it means kids are being bussed for two hours a day for, to, for their equal right to a particular kind of education. And then it turns out the very students who were supposed to be helped by that, it's their parents saying, please stop doing this. This is insanity. Why are we doing this? The god of equality is very difficult to satiate. And, right. and the state knows that it will require constant intervention. So, for instance, the, the classic example that um, – oh, now what's his name? Robert Nozick gave in his book um, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. He says, take Wilt Chamberlain, you know, the old basketball legend. And he says, now, let's imagine we all start at an equal material level. We all have absolutely equal possessions. But then one day we all want to go see Wilt Chamberlain play basketball. So everybody pays 25 cents to Wilt Chamberlain to watch him play basketball. Now, instantly, equality has been disrupted. And now, Will Chamberlain is super rich. So now, what is the idea then? Is Will Chamberlain now re required to give everybody their money back? <laughs> well, then, so, in other words, right. he's supposed to play basketball for free? So, instantly, the very first transaction, we've upset equality. Right. So, if you're going to enforce equality in its most radical meanings, it requires constant social management, right. which is precisely what people with PhDs who think they know how to run people's lives better than they themselves do, this is what they're trained to do, right. is manage society. And the idea, the liberating idea that maybe society could manage itself, it's no wonder these people go out of their way to ridicule and demonize that idea. That's so simple and simplistic. Why, you need us ruling over you. I'm not so sure I do. That's what my show is all about. I like that Notzik uses the example of you know, uh, t taking taxation and 
uh, economic liberty and sort of reframing the issue and saying, well, if we have to make everything equal, do you guys agree that we should that we should have uh, marriage equality in the sense that um, if you're born unattractive, uh, some woman is forced to marry you, right? And he and he right. just shifts that over there. Oh yeah, or or there's been um, the example because because they'll say uh, we can redistribute things because they have all reasons why they can the Rawlsian notion of yeah. cosmic injustice, well, right? And you're not entitled like even if you have a talent, you're not entitled to the fruits <laughs> of that talent. If you if you're a great chess player, you're not really entitled to that. And so what it, what what they think follows from that is therefore we can take your stuff, which doesn't really follow. So so they'll they'll or they'll even say, and even if you say, but it took a lot of hard work for me to really cultivate this talent, they'll say the inclination toward hard work is also something you don't deserve. <laughs> and so one of the um, arguments that's been used to to really make them think through the real logic of this is, let's suppose you're blind, and I have two functioning eyes. Now, I don't strictly deserve to have two functioning eyes. I could, there but for the grace of God go I, I could just as easily have been blind. So supposing that the biology could work this way, what is there to stop the idea that uh, some, that they should be able to take one of my functioning eyes and give it to the blind man? Because after all, I'll still be able to see. It's, it's not, you know, that, I mean, it's an inconvenience, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas this guy goes from no sight at all to being sighted. So why shouldn't people be able to take body parts even from other people to equalize things. You realize once you start going down this path and it leads you to absurd conclusions that maybe the first step you took down the path was absurd. Right. And the way I explain positive versus negative rights to students is I say, you know, a negative right is your right from being messed with. Yeah. You don't have a right to health care, right? Uh, South Africa has a right to health care in their constitution, but do they have a health care system that works? Declaring things rights doesn't just magically make them appear, right? Um, and, I, and I tell my students, I try to pick an issue that they would find ludicrous. And I say, imagine the Second Amendment, imagine that were a positive right, that would mean that the government has the responsibility of furnishing every American with a firearm. Do you think that that even makes sense? Universally, no, that's wacko. Right? You have a right to purchase, to enter the free market and purchase a firearm. And that's how all of the uh, the rights contained within the Bill of Rights work. Yeah, exactly. That's what they are. I wanted to shift a little bit. I've been on a lock notesick kick lately, and I do consider myself a Lockean natural rights guy. And one question that I've been asking myself, although I don't feel I have the historical background to answer my own question, is Locke's impact on the American founders. Um, I teach a high school philosophy class, uh, two sections of it, and I spend a long time on Locke's natural rights. Uh, to what extent do you think Locke's work influenced the founders, influenced the founding fathers? Um, were people like Jefferson and Madison reading Locke? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they were extremely widely read. Uh, so they had, they had read the, the major thinkers and some thinkers who today we would think to be minor thinkers, but were major thinkers in their day, like Algernon Sidney or uh, well Montesquieu was a major Montesquieu. figure at, at, at any time. But they were very familiar with this. And obviously you do see Lockean language coming out of Jefferson. So they're, they're quite familiar uh, with him. And the thing is, there has actually been a controversy among American historians that's raged for probably half a century about the extent to which the American – revolution and the American founding fathers should be thought of first as liberals in the classical Lockean sense, not obviously not the Probably. Hillary Clinton sense, or should they be thought first and foremost as Republicans so that they, they think of, uh, you know, a self-governing society and, and, and this and that and virtue and all that. And, and, and so what the Republican school had been trying to do for a long time was to downplay the role of Locke and say that that's not really the central thrust. But my sense is that the Lockeans are starting to get the upper hand in this uh, in this conversation. So I don't see what the point is of of denying the centrality of Locke unless you have an agenda. Right. And I think typically the agenda is people realize that I mean this is one of the cases, as Murray Rothbard said, that in which the idea of Locke as being basically a classical liberal who was you know. A, pretty close to libertarianism. In, in fact, uh, I, uh, Simmons is his last name. I can't remember. It might be John Simmons. A biographer or a, a scholar of Locke has a book called something like On the Edge of Anarchy, arguing that that's just how much of a minimal government guy Locke was. 
And Rothbard says, all right, the conventional wisdom actually has Locke correct. That is who he was. That is what he believed. So there are plenty of American um, thinkers who would prefer to believe that American society does not owe anything to Locke. Right? You'd, you'd rather grasp for any other influence on the Founding Fathers other than Locke. So I personally think that's what was driving that, that debate. But we're so incredibly Lockean. I mean, even if you take life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you get the sense that, of course, Jefferson was modeling uh, this off of um, you know uh, the sort of philosophy of happiness in in the United States, and I know that he uh, the founding fathers were working off of different state constitutions and things like that. But the idea, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, is is that you need property rights to to pursue happiness in the first place. Uh, that's that's a a lot of people have argued it precisely that way, and. Once you give it some thought, you, you realize how difficult it is to deny that. And the thing is, even the even the communists would would say you could have your own toothbrush. You know, like they, right. they wouldn't say that the whole neighborhood owns your toothbrush. Like right. even they have some standards. But beyond that, the idea that you could own land. Right. You could actually own land and work that land and be entitled to the fruits of that of that land. Right. Now we're getting now we're starting to get into what seems like common sense to you and me, but in these debates would be considered controversial. Right. And, and in fact, it was Rousseau who said that the first person who stood his ground on some plot of land and said, this is mine, became responsible for all the violence ever in the history of the world. <laughs> but, but the p problem with that is we have, each, each of us, we basically have potentially unlimited desires. Right. Because, you know, in principle... I'd like to have a uh, prime rib every single day and I'd like to go on a cruise every week and I'd like to, you know, maybe I would like all these things or I would like to have a gardener and a personal chef and a driver and all these things. The trouble is just the mathematics of it mean that if I'm employing five people, not everybody can employ five people. Where are all the people going to come from? So in other words, there's a limit to how, how many of my desires can be satisfied. So, and, and in other words, we have scarcity. We have only so much land. Mm -hmm. We have only so many resources, only so much of this and that and the other. And so there has to be some way where – and we all want – we all want to live on the coast and we all want this and that. There has to be some peaceful way by which we resolve this, and property is the only one that I can see that makes intuitive sense to people and – you know, can be universally applied without contradiction. So, I mean, I've I've had episodes on my show where I've gone through and explained why this is actually the best possible arrangement, uh, and and that's what Locke <clears throat> is fundamentally about is property, and and that's what the the framers are are thinking of. And of course, I mean, even think about how difficult it is when the state is you know basically the owner of the means of production, and can therefore, if it wants to. Keep out of your hands the things you would need to mount a resistance if right. it came to that. Right. So how are you going to own your own newspaper when they have all the means of production? Right. How you know how are you going to make photocopies if they're not going to let you have a copy machine? You know you have to. Sm so basically, people smuggled stuff into the Soviet Union. They you know videotapes and whatever things that showed them what life was like outside the Soviet Union that undermined the system. But they themselves, on their own, it was very very difficult. To coordinate resistance because they couldn't, they couldn't own the wherewithal that you would need to to mount the resistance. Right. My the thing that my students and I work with, you know, high school uh, sophomores and juniors and seniors. The thing that they always have a problem with is they do not understand fundamentally how you can have a right before government gives it to you. Do, you know, they they ask me, yeah, but how could you have a right that is objective without the government first giving it to you? And I have to explain to them, look. You first have to believe that things are true. There's a lot of moral relativism going on. Think about what it even means to be a human person. What it means to be a human person is that you have a right to your own life. The definition, so I'm trying to explain to them how your, the right to your own life is deductive from the fact that you're even a human. The definition of a human, like tautologically, is that you exist over time 
as a person. You're not a human unless you exist and retain your identity over time. Yeah. Right. And so if you do, if we can even acknowledge that there's such a thing as a person, then you must have a right to your own life. And if you have a right to your own life, you have a right to your own body. And if you have a right to your own body, then you have a right to your own labor. And if you have a right to your own labor, then you have a right to the fruits of your labor. And if you well, have a right to the, the fruits the, of your what was the problem? They were, was the problem that they were saying that that we couldn't cons- we wouldn't come up with the idea. It wouldn't be consistent across people unless the government stated it to us. Or is it that no, we the, have the we'd have the rights, but they wouldn't be secure? Well, it, it, they they actually believe that there there could not objectively be a thing in a state of nature like a right. Like like who's giving it to us? Now I know you can go the God route and do like Locke does and say that you're God's property. Of course, and then so it would be morally wrong to violate, uh, you know, uh, God's property rights. But the thing that I'm trying to explain to them from a secular point of view is that what it even means to be a person and what what it means for rights to be self-evident is that if you're going to be an isolated person that exists over time, you have to have a right to your own existence so that all of the other rights spring from forth from the right to life. Using your reason, you you can come to this. Or you could even, if you really are having trouble, you could you could try and reverse it and say, all right, if if my having a right is difficult for you to conceive of in the state of nature, then think of it this way. Because uh, by the way, Locke's view was that in this, it was not that in the state of nature we have no rights. We do have we rights. We do have we rights, just, of course. We just enjoy them precariously. Right. Whereas the Hobbesian view was that basically anything goes, nobody has anything in the right. state of nature. And then you need well, the Leviathan hold that view. to keep us in check, so, right. Right. So it was not that the government was granting us anything. It was recognizing. And the idea, at exactly. least, was that it was going to protect more effectively rights we already had. Right. Now, you, but you could say to those students, all right, if you feel funny saying I have a right, then I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'll simply say that in that state of nature, you ha- I agree with you. You have no right to assault me. You have no right to take myself because you would have to justify that. I mean, what what I find interesting is that they would feel like they can't justify a right to their own life. But all right, then let's start. If if your problem is you have trouble justifying rights, then let's start with ones we can all agree on. You couldn't justify your right to steal from me. You couldn't right, justify your right. And so I would start with that and say you certainly don't have these offensive rights. But are you really going to say that you wouldn't have some kind of right to stay alive, to well, appropriate to yourself things that keep you Right. In existence, and I do say that. And and the thing with you know you have a, you kind of you have a right to swing your fist until the other person's nose begins. I do tell them that every right comes with a corresponding duty. Right, that if you're a person, so are they, and they have the same rights that you do. Right, necessarily. Um, I think that it has. I think it's a bit of a moral relativism thing. The idea that they can't even imagine how it is the case that your rights are objective, such that when governments are formed, they're formed to protect those rights. And that's when I I have to get even deeper and start talking about. There are a priori truths like two plus two equals four. Then there are a posteriori truths like truths of the natural sciences. And the way I explain it to them, and you may disagree with this, but this is how I come at it, is I say that that natural rights are anthropocentric truths. They're truths that are true because of the kinds of creatures we are, right? Which is, I tell the students, you know, you watch National Geographic and there's a lion ripping apart a gazelle, right? You don't get outraged about it because they don't have the same rights that you do. Right. Animals are free to rape each other in nature. They don't have the same rights that you do and that you have the kinds of rights that you do because of the kinds of creatures that we as human beings are. And that starts to get them understanding how there can be such a thing as a reasoned based claim for the idea that there are natural rights that precede government. Yeah. Also, the fact that we are capable of language Right. What purpose? Now, I'm old fashioned. I, <laughs> I think things have purposes. Me too. A telos. You know, how about that? Right. Yeah. Things have purposes. What would be the purpose of language if not to foster cooperation mm-hmm. between people? Very good. Yeah. I mean, if, if I want to kill you, I don't have to tell you that I'm going to do it. Right. <laughs> I can just do it. But if but if you and I are going to build a skyscraper, we're going to need to talk this over. That's right. So that that alone should say to you, we need to be building a society in which we have institutions that foster the cooperation. Mm-hmm. And ma- namely, that just means if you could stop punching me in the face, that would be nice. You know, that's just, you really just need a bare minimum of, of, of mutual recognitions. And and I, I'm surprised to hear that your students level that uh, objection because I 
don't generally come across students who are even thinking at that level. Mostly they're thinking, I oh, I have a right to do whatever I want to do. I mean, basically, if you're going, it's like the Beastie Boys. You know, they they, they want to fight to their for their right to party. That's right. about the level that my students were at. And so the idea that they would uh, question whether that they'd have these rights in the state of nature, this thought would not dawn on them. But then they'll turn around and say, but if a majority vote says I don't have this right anymore, then, you know, what, who am I to say? Oh, you were doing so well. I know. <laughs> and that's when I say appeal to popularity fallacy, right? And and I do say things to them like, you know, your claim that, that, uh, that morality is completely subjective makes it s- such that you can't say that Hitler was an evil guy. You can't say that anymore. You are not allowed to say that because who are you to say? Right? Who are you to make that case? Who are you to say? Right? And so I'm kind of a Kantian a little bit in that sense. And you brought up stealing earlier. And I'll tell them, look, if you universalize stealing, there can be no such thing as personal property. And if there's no such thing as personal property, then there could be no such thing as stealing. S- stealing is morally wrong objectively. And so, but but as you said, most teenagers aren't thinking that way. I do teach an ad, advanced uh math and science academy charter school. I teach at the second best uh, public school in the state of Massachusetts. So these kids are just all over everything. I didn't know. Well, after we go off the air, I want to ask you where you are because uh, because I I'm from there and I want to I'm just curious. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. I I grew up in North Andover. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Talk. This is one of the best charter schools in the entire country. Top top 20 or something like that. Um, so of course they they do ask me the hard questions and and uh, but I wanted that's to ask fun yeah it, it's a lot of fun yeah. I love debating yeah. with those kids um, I wanted to ask how you come at property rights do you subscribe to labor theory of property do you subscribe to the idea that you know if you mix your labor with the land that you have a right in a state of nature to appropriate property and then you know of course that your money is your property and your body's your property and the fruits of your labor, that's your property right, as well. Right, the Lockean uh, interpretation, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm inclined to state it more along the lines, uh, coming at it with Hans Hoppe, of a first user principle. So, I mean, generally we're not in a state where there's a lot of, of never-owned land, right? right? But, but let's say we extend back into the, the mists of time and we have a lot of uh, property that's unowned. How does it come to be owned is the question. Mm-hmm. And... This is precisely the question I was kind of implicitly driving at before, which is in order to minimize conflict in society or or to obviate uh, conflict altogether, we have to figure out a way to decide who gets to use a particular thing because there may be many more people who want to use it than there are its to be used. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide that? And, And you could think of a lot of different ways. You could think of just, okay, verbal declaration. I just declare that to be my thing. But then what would happen? Everyone would just start shouting, and then, well, who said it first, and who was the loudest? And So that can't really work. And so when you start to think, well, what if we said, what if we said the fifth person? Or, or no, what if we said everybody, everybody equally has a, has a stake in that particular use of that thing? Well, then that would mean, given that ownership means dis- being able to decide how a thing is disposed of, then... Who could use it? You'd have to get the consent of every living person. We'd all be dead <laughs> before we could use anything. So that, if my, the Woods rule is, if a, if a if an approach to to society would lead to the extinction of the human race, it can be ruled out. Right. That's Kantian. So, That's very Kantian. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because it would be. Yeah. It would. We would. If we try to universalize it, and we're all dead. <laughs> Not good. Exactly. So so, what about the first user of a thing? That's at least something we can all see. This person's the first user, and and that at least that gives us a way of say of, of assigning. All right, this person now has some kind of sovereignty over this particular thing mm-hmm. by virtue of being the first user, and then he can hand it on. Whatever, because I mean, we even know instinctively. Well, I had it first. Gives you some kind of claim, but you may say, well, it's morally arbitrary to be the first one. Why not the fifth one? Well, here's why not the fifth one. Because if it has to be, if it's that the fifth one can get to use it, so then what, the first four people, what happens? None of them can exercise it. So if it's grapes, I can't actually eat the grapes because I'm the first one. We have to wait for the fifth guy to come along. I, I mean, there's no way for that ever to work. So when you, in other words, with, with Hoppe's outlook, you pretty much rule out all other possibilities. 
Because it can't be joint ownership because you would never be able to get the consent of everybody on a practical level to ever be able to put your ownership into practice. And so the, the only thing that's left is first user, which typically does mean a kind of homesteading process uh, where, you know, you, because a homesteader in Locke's view is a first user. Right. Uh, because you don't have to home if you're the 58th user, it's been handed down or sold and nobody even knows who the first user was. In Locke's view, you don't have to keep homesteading it forever. Uh, you don't have to keep, to, you know, at that point you can just enjoy the beauty of it if you mm -hmm. want and you're the rightful owner. So does there have to be um, enough and as good left in common, and do you have to mix your labor with the land, such that uh. the land's an extension <laughs> of your of your body and the and your exertions and your time, which is your property just as well as your body is? What do you think about that? I'm not sure well, how I feel yeah, completely about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the Lockean proviso, as much and as good left for others. Now, my wing of libertarianism does not really like the Lockean proviso. Okay. <laughs> and also, um, the introduction, and I believe Locke gets into this at some point, the introduction in society of money helps to resolve some of his concerns, which would be that if somebody's got all this excess property and you know he's, got, he's produced stuff that just spoils and goes to waste, right. but... With a money economy, you can have freedom of exchange and all these sorts of things get resolved. I'm not sure that uh, that yeah, I I don't I just I don't go for the lock-in proviso, but I don't think I can give you a pithy response. I'd have to sure. write it out. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So one of the one of your recent episodes, you talked about the social contract, and I thought it was such a great episode. You went through all of these different. Um, uh, uh, rebuttals to the social contract. Tom, do we live within or must we obey a social contract? What are your thoughts on this? I think the existence of social contract thinking is an attempt by people who believe in the state. And there are people who believe in the state and they just want it to do a few small things. And there are others who want full on social engineering via the state. But what they have in common is they want to justify the state. They, they don't want it to seem like this is just a bunch of thieves taking your stuff. They want to say, the, this is categorically different. The stationary people, bandit. Right, exactly. And so the way they do, they, 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 what, the thing is they absolutely do not want to have to bring themselves to say uh, that the, they don't want to state the brute fact that you are being ruled. What they want to say is you consented to this. So in a way, <laughs> it's kind of like you ruling yourself. I mean, they, <laughs> And I think this comes out of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment does not want to talk about some people rule and other people rule. They want to talk um, uh, more about consent. Um, and, and there's a lot of great stuff that comes out of that with consent. I mean, I think a, a, a society of contract is better than a society of status. Mm -hmm. I think that is an improvement. But that meant that they had to make society itself into like a contract because that was a model that they used for thinking about all other human relations. So society must be like a contract. But then they look at it, and most of them admit, all right, well, the, it never actually turned out like that. Like, they ne never really was there a case where people got together and all agreed to something. So we have to then come up with some way we can say that it's almost like you did that. Or in certain hypothetical situations, we know you would have done that. Or by virtue of some of the actions you're taking, you have more or less done that. And they've got to cling to this. <laughs> I don't remember case, signing a contract. Exactly. In every case, it's always a more or less, or it's kind of like, or it's... It, and, and it's like they never – you never hear somebody argue this weakly uh, for, other, <laughs> for other things. It's clearly because they want it to come out this way. And you know who did sign a contract? The only person I can think of who did sign a contract were people who agreed to – uphold the principles of the constitution right our leaders right they, they call the constitution the rule that governs our rulers the law that right. governs our lawmakers they actually do sign a social contract probably right yeah you would think so i mean and and this is one of the reasons that that it's it's difficult to credit social contract theory because a contract is supposed to be by definition mutual mutual so your point just now that Implicitly, at least, they've they've signed something. I mean, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they 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 swear to uphold the Constitution. So you would think this would be a mutual arrangement <laughs> that yes, we have our responsibilities toward the state. We got to pay our taxes and obey the laws, but they then have to fulfill their side of the bargain, which is 
they have to protect us from crime and from foreign invasion and whatever else they, they say they do. The Green New Deal. <laughs> right. Well, whatever, whatever it is. But, even, but, let's, but, but let's make it more difficult on me. So like, don't give me an easy one like the Green New Deal. Let's let's say uh, protect me from crime, because that seems unobjectionable. I would like to be protected from crime. But the trouble is that you can't enforce against them any kind of judgment that they have failed in their side of the bargain. That's if you true. don't pay your taxes, you're going to prison. Right. But if they don't uphold their side, and then they'll come back and say, "Well, nobody's perfect. We, you know, nobody could could catch every criminal." But I, in that episode, I gave the example of a famous court case from 1975, which has been repeated numerous times since then, in which it was clearly shown that the state had been grossly negligent in protecting three women from an attack, grossly, absurdly negligent. But the ruling was the state has no obligation to protect any particular person. It has an obligation to provide a general umbrella of protection, but it has no obligation to any individual. Then by, by the definition of any contract – by any contract standards that we have in any other aspect of society, it would be instantly invalidated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably the importance of the Declaration of Independence and the Second Amendment and the idea that if the state promises that they have signed this contract and they're going to protect our natural rights and they fail to, it's our job to pick up our guns. Well, that is ultimately in the last resort what people are supposed to do. And you, you know, this that rarely works out well. I and mean, it worked out well in the American case. But it worked out. It was so surprising to people that George Washington just laid down his arms and went home that, you know, it is it is true. The king of England says it. Uh, he, he truly is the greatest man in the world. But you sometimes know, it works, no one right? That. Sometimes it works. Like the Whiskey Rebellion is a good example of at least something coming out of that, right? The the uh, this was an armed uprising against the federal government. That's you know, true. It was eventually put down, but it but it but it led to the repeal of the whiskey tax and the yeah, election. Yeah, right. Jefferson, of Jefferson. When he over, got in, he did get rid. Of, yeah, that's over true. Adams. Yeah, yeah. And then what 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 was interesting was that although the Whiskey Rebellion took place in uh, Western Pennsylvania. The, the resistance to the whiskey tax was much more extensive than – it was not confined to western Pennsylvania. A lot of the backcountry areas were resisting it, and there it just seemed so hopeless to try to fight them that they just more or less looked the other way, and these mm-hmm. people just got away with not paying. Nobody wanted to be a, a, a tax collector in that area, right. so it just went undone. That's my kind of resistance That's where right. the public is so on board with something that they – and, and in a way – I wouldn't say that the model is precisely the same, but the way the homeschooling movement began to flourish, I mean, that was not exactly encouraged by our cultural betters, let's say, right. Right? whose job it is to educate us and, and tell us what to think. And for parents who said, you know, in this particular situation, I think I could do a better job, this was not uh, anything that was encouraged. It was positively discouraged. But when enough people said, we're doing it, well, what are you going to do, roll in the tanks? At some point— Something simply becomes a fait accompli, right. and the regime has to adapt itself to it. Are your kids homeschooled? We did homeschool them for a time. At this point, um, we found a private school that we're happy with. Great. Um, I want to ask you just a couple more questions. I want to switch over to the Constitution and specifically how we should read the Constitution. This is great because I was listening to uh, a debate uh, between a couple of uh, law professors, Randy Barnett and Michael Dorf. And I know you were you were there because yeah. during the Q&A at the end, a one a Thomas Woods uh, got up and asked a question. Uh, I don't right. remember what your question was. Um, uh, but what is your perspective on this? Uh, I would imagine that you are some kind of constitutional originalist, but uh, what is, exactly does that mean? Uh, are you an intent originalist or are you a uh, textual originalist of some kind with like the public meaning in mind or something like that? How do you approach this? Right. Now, Randy Barnett is a textual originalist. I love and, Randy. Yeah, and he's he's very good on 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 a lot of things. Uh, I, I have some nits to pick here and there, but again, given the state of society, <laughs> I would not exactly say Randy Barnett is my enemy, <laughs> right? But when it comes to the Constitution, I mean, I, you know, even the Constitution is too much government for me, but I still, as a historian, I'm interested in talking about it, and I am interested in, well, what would be the correct way to read this thing? What 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 is the most plausible way to do it? I tend to incline toward, toward the... Um, 
the intent reading. And and by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, what we're talking about is originalism is the idea that we ought to be looking at what the original – we want to be looking at the Constitution and at the ratifying conventions whereby the Constitution's meaning was hashed out by people. What did people think it meant? What did mm-hmm. people – because that's true of if, – if you, if you have a will – you always want to look at, well, what was the intention of the testator mm-hmm. when, when, when mm-hmm. writing out this will? Good point. So that is part of it. So, so we look at the ratifying conventions. We look at the, Now, what, what the – and, and I, I am inclined to think that what they said at those conventions, not, not at the Philadelphia convention because there that was behind closed doors. Nobody could have known what they said. It's more what was said at the ratifying convention because this is where the document was presented to the public mm-hmm. and where they said, here, this is what you're committing yourselves to. I think that is a public – process by which people are told here's the nature of the thing you're about to agree mm-hmm. to so if that's not where we can look for what this thing means i don't know where mm-hmm. now what what so that would be an intent originalist what was the intent of what these the, this wording meant tom can the i te- ask you a question here Does, yeah. it, could intent also mean and i'm not i don't know if there's a school for this could intent also mean what the intended principles were behind the words, like what the wor- what which principles the words were intended to represent and communicate? I think so, but here here's where I'd get into textual originalism. In fact, sometimes they call it original intent and original meaning. That's how they uh, often distinguish it. And oh, so I, like that. I, I would say that the the most um, Let's say I, I hate to use the word extreme because a lot of times we use extreme in a as, and it has a negative connotation. I just mean that as literally the person who took it the farthest um, exponent of original meaning was a, a 19th century uh, lawyer named Lysander Spooner. Right, right. And it so happens that um, Randy Barnett is a huge fan of Lysander he Spooner. Mentioned him. And I, That's the only way I know Lysander Spooner. Oh, okay. And, and in fact, he, Barnett I think, talks about him. Yeah, the, I think the Lysander Spooner website is in some way either owned or controlled by by, by uh, Randy Barnett. But anyway, Spooner uh, had a bit of an evolution in his thought. But in his earlier thinking, uh, before he kind of just rejected the Constitution altogether at, because he never consented to it, he had a, a, a lengthy work called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. And that that is a bold title, isn't it? The yeah. Unconstitutionality of Slavery. Because – Remember that the the abolitionists were of the view, like William Lloyd Garrison, that the Constitution sanctioned slavery, right? And that's why it was a a contract, a bargain with the devil, and that's why there were abolitionists who would publicly burn copies of the Constitution. Right. And Spooner came along and said, "Now wait a minute, not so fast." And it was and Frederick Douglass um, wound up taking up Spooner's analysis. Yes, what he did was yes. he looked through the various provisions of the Constitution that have been taken to indicate support for slavery. So there's a provision about uh, the slave trade and, and abolish you know, the slave trade can't be abolished till 1808 and stuff like that. But it doesn't say slave trade, does it? Uh, you know, it talks about importation. Right. But it doesn't talk about the slave trade. In fact, the word slavery is not, not in, the Constitution. in the Constitution. Yep. So so anyway, so there are several clauses that we all sort of know about that deal with slavery. So what he does is he 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 says he says slavery is such an abomination. It is such an egregious violation of natural law that we have to strain the meaning of words if that's what it takes uh, before we concede that slavery is allowed in this document. Okay, we even if we're interpreting it in a way that seems implausible, as long as it's somehow within the realm of possibility of meaning, then the demands of natural law require us to accept that meaning first. He says, mm-hmm. So I don't care what people said in some closed door meeting. I don't care what they said. What, what we have are these words, and I'm going to look at what these words mean. Right. And I'm going to tell you – I'm going to give you perfectly plausible uh, meanings of these different clauses. So I did a uh, – I have a lecture on this that we can link to where I go through the different – and I show how Spooner interprets them. But his point is I can interpret these clauses without at any time referring to the institution of slavery. Right. Therefore, it does not pass the test. It, it, it doesn't because, – because our inclination must always be anti-slavery. Right. And you're going to have to have a you got a, a tough row to hoe if you're going to convince me otherwise. So that's how he argued that on the basis of original meaning, and that's why original meaning has some draw for me as a as a radical libertarian because 
you know, I said because there are two ways I can be anti-slavery in, uh, um, as an American. I can I can adopt the the one of the I can adopt the Spooner view and say the Constitution is anti-slavery, or I can throw over the whole Constitution. Right. Original intent is going to keep me with slavery. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and so that that alone gotcha makes me inclined toward original meaning, but. There's still something that nags at me about that. I still feel like there's something not fully above board about that. You know, right. like if you want to be against slavery, then just say, look, um, we have to go beyond the Constitution on this. I'd rather say that, I think. We have to go beyond. There are some th- areas of life where the Constitution just doesn't, doesn't answer, you know, and we have to go beyond. Rather than say, well, it really is anti slavery, I would rather just say, Look, in this case, we're dealing with such a moral enormity mm-hmm. that we have to be extra constitutional on it. You know, like yeah. go, go beyond the constitution. I think I'd rather do that. So that's why I feel like if the original intent, if 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 what people were told the meaning was is not the the what governs us, then I think it's just arbitrary. You don't think we could get there just by textual, literal reading of the words? Because I can't see anywhere in the Constitution that would condone slavery, or even if you just add it up. Everything in the Constitution that contradicts slavery, and then you point to some iffy things that you're not sure about. Clearly, the Constitution says that all that that yeah, the Declaration yeah. says all men are created equal, uh, all of our liberties and the Bill of Rights, and things like this. I can't see how the Constitution. And I think that the best abolitionists and civil rights leaders are people who said we are not living up to the Constitution versus the Malcolm X like you know, the white man's bad and the Constitution's bad and all of this. Martin but Luther the thing King, is that no. I guess my answer would be that the people who were discussing this certainly uh, that's true. knew they were talking about slavery. Right, that's So that's true. why I would rather just say, uh, look, it's it's a pretty good thing, but it's not perfect. And, and, you know, rather than say, oh, but look, I just discovered in my laboratory <laughs> that it's actually anti-slavery. So so yeah. I stick to the, the originalism. And what originalism gives you is an ex- is a very limited government. Now, if you just stick to well, I'm gonna de- I'm gonna I'm gonna try and figure out what all the words mean. The trouble with that is um, you're gonna argue forever about what general welfare means. Right. But if you go by original intent, then you read what Madison says about general welfare. Right. You read what the uh, ratifiers said about general That's welfare. That's true. And they yeah. and they all say. Look, we drew this phrase from the Articles of Confederation, where mm-hmm. everybody knows it didn't mean we can do anything. Right. Right. And so that helped because otherwise, uh, like uh, re- regulating interstate commerce. Well, if you just look at the words, you could imagine somebody saying, oh, well, good. The federal government is living up to that today. And now, on the other hand, if you're a really good textualist, textualist, you can find that regulate had rather a different meaning in the in the 18th century than it has today. But interesting. Um, I mean, I basically I think that in general, the textual, the the, the original meaning and original intent uh, interpretations, I think by and large tend to reach the same conclusions. Mm. Like, I don't think uh, a Scalia and a Randy Barnett have absolutely, in, you know, um, an, an unbridgeable chasm separating them. I, mm-hmm. I don't. So, uh, so then, when you look at the Supreme Court now, since you mentioned Scalia, who is reading the Constitution correctly? Who among our justices is a model for um, what a, a justice should look like? I like Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas, um, tell me who you like and, and why, and, and how do you feel about the makeup of the court right now? Well, I haven't been able to follow them closely enough to say, but I did read the entire uh, decision, and now I <laughs> my, my middle-aged memory, the decision on the, 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 the guy with the bakery, and yeah, did he have yeah. to bake the cake sure. for that, for that mm-hmm. wedding? Um, I, I read that entire thing. I did an episode of my show where I just went through my reading. I listened of it. to that. It was great. It was okay, a great thanks, episode. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I, I went through the the decision for the court, and then I went through the the um, the uh, dissents. I have and a I little went through file where I collect things that I need to make, to help me make my arguments. That's in my oh, wonderful. Thanks. It's fantastic. Thanks. And I I thought Gorsuch really uh, acquitted himself well in that decision, uh, and I thought Thomas also. Uh, did so. Why I like Thomas is that he seems to be the one who is the most likely of anyone on the court to step back from the passing events of the day and see the larger constitutional Mm -hmm. issue at stake. So half the court or more than half the court will be arguing whether the 
interstate, you know, whether some trivial action by somebody really could be said to affect interstate commerce, mm-hmm. you know, and we all know it doesn't, right? We, we all know, you know, well, if he blew leaves off his yard into a yard <laughs> across into another state, then that guy had to go buy a rake and he bought that rake in some other state. So it's interstate commerce so we can regulate the guy blowing leaves. <laughs> and I mean, you know, like we all know that that's a, so anyway, so, so most of the court will be arguing about whether that constitutes interstate commerce or not. And it'll be Thomas who says, could we take a minute to go back and, and talk about what was meant to be accomplished by this clause? And so that's what he'll do in a lot of cases, right. a lot of different types of clauses. He'll say, why don't we bother to look at – instead of getting into this minutia, why don't we look at the fundamentals of the case? And, and we need somebody like that, and I don't think anyone does that as reliably as Thomas. Probably so. How about Trump? Has Trump been a good president for liberty, all things considered? Does – well, I shouldn't ask this. This is a disingenuous question question does trump care about the constitution probably not but has he governed conservatively is has he been a good uh president for liberty all things considered okay well has he governed conservatively then we have we thought it was difficult to to nail down original meaning constitutionalism the idea of (laughs) what it means to govern conservatively i don't even know what it means anymore (laughs) given all the meanings of conservative but um you know look there are pluses and minuses with him uh you know, in in that the Supreme Court is a key thing, and there's just no getting around that. Maybe, right. maybe there are a lot of things about Trump that rub you the wrong way, but that Supreme Court can be an imperial institution, and that's precisely why you have so many Democrats talking about packing the court. They want to right. add five or six more justices to the court, and I predicted that would happen uh, after the Kavanaugh uh, uh, hearings. I predict they, I said, these people are not just going to roll over and say, "Well, for the next thirty years, we lost the court." That is not how the left operates ever. Um, the right is very good at being obedient losers. You know, they'll sit back and they'll give conferences about why it's good for us to be losers because we're abiding by the rules or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, whereas the left is they're going to burn the thing to the ground before they lose. Right? They're going to get out there and fight. So I knew that was coming. Uh, and, and he has given – I mean, now, Kavanaugh I'm not as big on, but I do think Gorsuch was about as good as we were going to get given the plausible candidates. And so – that's a that's a significant thing, uh, and a lot of times the good that the court can do is is by doing nothing. It's by not intervening. It's right. by not by not engineering more social revolutions right. in the country. Secondly, it is true that on deregulation, he really has been good. If you look at the numbers in terms of new regulations versus repealed ones, he's been very good on that. Mm-hmm. My colleague Bob Murphy, who's a, a specialist in energy policy, says, look, the energy policy community, the free market energy policy community, is delighted with with, with Trump, even if they don't like his personality or whatever that other stuff is. Where, But to me, the big issues are not I – mean, yeah, sometimes he says things that he shouldn't say, whatever, you know, I mean, I – at this point, if you don't have a thick skin in America, you know you're never going to have one. Right. But, but to me, the the much bigger issues are two of my big ones, which would be foreign policy. Um, I think that the the foreign policy, at least of the past twenty years, has not been conservative and has not been has not racked up a lot of victories. Uh, it's been it's been really a disastrous foreign policy, and and he kind of knows that on some level. But he's surrounded himself by uh, dead enders who just are going to continue the same mistakes over and over that are just blowing a lot of money on crazy enlightenment schemes. You know, well, we need to have more women's schools in Afghanistan or something. I mean, this is absurd. Your society's collapsing. Uh, socially, we're totally – we have a society that's at war. Half of it is at war with the other half. I think we got to focus on that primarily. Uh, but he's surrounded himself by people who kind of want to keep it going, and then he wants to increase the budget. When the U.S. is spending as much on the military as all other countries combined, that's not sustainable. So that's a disappointment given his rhetoric before. And then on the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, he just wants more low interest rates as if as if the choice is low interest rates and prosperity and high interest rates and 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 uh, recession. When if that were as easy as it was, this sounds like the left when they say, you know, what we need are unions and high minimum wages and then we'll be prosperous. Okay, you really think we go to Bangladesh and we say, look, I can't believe how stupid we've been all these years. Why didn't we tell you guys that all you need to lift out of, sell out of poverty is unions and a minimum wage? That would do nothing other than make people in Bangladesh even more unemployable than they currently mm-hmm. are. So likewise with the Fed, uh, you've got to let interest rates go where they're going to go. 
The same way you got to let the price of milk go where it's going to go. And if you don't, then you wind up mispricing things and introducing distortions mm -hmm. and sowing the seeds for later problems. So it's it's. But on the other hand, compared to what? Right. How many presidents have we had who really understood the Fed right. and, and monetary policy? I mean, basically none. So maybe you'll say I'm being unfair in how I evaluate him. And on foreign policy, compared to what? They've all been disasters on foreign policy. Right. So compared to what? Right. So on the things where he's bad, I think he – now, there are some exceptions where things that he's bad where he's somewhat worse than others. But generally Tariffs? the things that he's Tariffs? bad on I – mean, yeah, I think on trade he's been, he's been worse. But the things he's good on – He's generally better than his predecessors have been. Like on deregulation, he's much better. And on the court, I think he's um, at least somewhat better than mm -hmm. his predecessors. So, you know, that's basically what we've got. I don't see, given this, Americans are not libertarians. That's a fact. That is a brute fact. They are not going to vote for a libertarian. They've made that clear. They, they want the government to do X and Y, and it's our job to convince them that they shouldn't need that. Yeah, that's but right. But given, given that that's what we've got, well, I mean, who is the plausible person out there who would have done better? I'm not saying, therefore, you got to go out and rah, rah, rah for the guy. I'm asking a question. Who is a, an electable person who would have done better? Because, of course, we can say, well, he's a disaster on X and Y and Z. And I agree. Yes, I know that. But I'm asking myself, right now in 2019, what can I legitimately hope for? Mm -hmm. I have two sets of hopes, what I really want to see and what I hope my girls live to see. And what I can plausibly reach for right now. Right. I plausibly cannot abolish the Fed. I, right. I can't. There are a lot of things I can't do. But maybe I could tilt the court in a certain direction. And maybe I could get rid of some regulations. So, you know, that's how I look at it. How about his free speech, his new campus free speech executive order? Um, whether or not you, uh, as a purist, completely agree with whether or not he he should have done that or if that should be an executive order do you think that it's going to work do you think it will enhance freedom and protect students liberties well i found out and i haven't read the whole thing myself but i found out that it it actually the stuff about free speech is not the majority of the text of that thing it has to do more about the tra being more transparent about the costs of education and stuff like that so it's I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd call it a bait and switch, but I know that people who favor free speech are actually saying we need more than this. There's mm. no enforcement mechanism mm. and and whatever. Um, but of course, what it goes to show is once the state, you know, once the federal government is involved in in handing out federal funding to universities, well, then you wind up with, you know, maybe you don't like a president interfering in their speaker invitation policy. Well. You got to take with the good with the. If you're going to take the money, right. Then you're going to you, then you're going to be subjecting yourself to this. Now the trouble would be that then the next president comes in with an executive order and says, uh, "I'm going to withhold funding from anybody who allows a, um, a basically a dissenting voice. You know, they'll call it a, a racist, but that just means anybody. That, that means anybody they don't. Ben like. Shapiro, whoever they don't like. Ben Shapiro would be would be ruled out as a racist. And and I don't see on what possible grounds you could call Ben Shapiro a racist. There's no way. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no way. And I could easily see them saying, now you don't get funding because you allowed this person – because basically we're going to come up with a category that we'll use to demonize everybody we dislike. And if you have anything to do with those people, then we'll withhold your funding. Right. Uh, you know, I would want to be a university that doesn't rely on that kind of funding. I would want to go to my donors and say, look, we don't want to be subject to the – we're here in principle at least – to look for the truth and to acquire knowledge and to and to engage in real meaningful research that improves human welfare and we should not be subject to the changing the ever changing whims of a uh, federal government and what we need is industry and private um, philanthropists and benefactors to help us do this job independently so that we can have a campus where we do what we darn well please <laughs> we ban people we want to ban we invite people we want to invite and if you don't like it, then don't send your kid here. But that's what our Great. university is about. Yeah. That's the model they should be going to. So um, you are, if I remember right, you are a, a member again of the Libertarian Party. Um, can you give me a, 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 switching over here, can you give me a, a candid sense of the Libertarian Party? Uh, if I remember, you were once at odds, uh, you were at odds with the party at one point, And now you're a member uh, again. Is that right? Well, I wasn't thrilled with people they were nominating for president, but you know I knew there were good people in the Libertarian Party, and I have spoken at many 
state conventions of the party. I've I've spoken at the national convention. I spoke at it in uh, 2016. So I'm very much in sympathy with what they're trying to do, but but there's a lot of uh, internal division within the party, and some of it is is just it is it's the party bringing it on itself. I mean, here you have an extreme minority party, right, that needs all the help it can get, mm-hmm. and their chairman picks fights with me constantly. I, I have never now people think you know you hear about people picking fights and you think. Ah, uh, well, you know, I'm probably only going to get half the story from one of the two parties. I'll need to hear from both the parties. And I understand that. But I, I absolutely insist that in no case, at not one of these times, have I thought, you know, today I'm going to pick a fight with the head of the Libertarian Party. That thought would never cross my mind. Not not ever. It, every single time, all of a sudden, I wake up and I'm being attacked by this guy. <laughs> now, I, Now, obviously, this is to signal to other people that people who have the kind of view that I gave you earlier, who come to libertarianism basically because, uh, not because I want to be free to live uh, unusual lifestyles, but precisely because I want to live my boring lifestyle <laughs> and be away from people who want to lecture and hound me about the, the benefits of other lifestyles. You know, Well, then if you want that, you go do that. But I'd like to do this. And this is not enough for, for some libertarians. They, they want us to sing the positive virtues of, of all other ways of living, except they'll never sing the positive virtues of my boring bourgeois life. That right. will not happen. Right. So I so that just kind of makes me a little crazy. But on the other hand, I refuse to give them the satisfaction of leaving. I ain't going nowhere. I refuse <laughs> to give them the satisfaction. I am absolutely staying, especially because I continue to get invited to speak at state Libertarian Party conventions. I have to turn most of them down because I, I just don't travel for speaking all that much anymore. But I, you know, I went and spoke at the 2016 convention. I got a thunderous standing ovation there. So you want to give me a hard time, then you better start lecturing your own members. But yeah, I mean, the, the divisions are cultural, but they're also strategic. The, the question would be, what is the purpose of the Libertarian Party? Is it there to get people elected to office, or is it there to have an alternative voice so that when the two bozos are arguing, there's somebody who says, look, they're both wrong in a fundamental way. And it's more important to me that the public understand that than that I myself even get elected. So what what is the – and I personally think there's a way to marry these two things together. And that would be I think the party should focus, at least at this stage, primarily on races at the most local level, races nobody knows about right. where you know $20,000 is all you need to raise, that sort of thing, and then get the libertarian name out there a bit. Now, on the other hand – it's easy for me to say that every four years, the presidential election is what gets the Libertarian Party a lot of attention, and it gets them donations. So it would be hard to withdraw from that scene altogether. I understand that. But it seems like the emphasis is so heavily on congressional and senatorial races instead of these little local races where you can really make a difference on the local level. Uh, so, so, bet- so I think, in other words, you can focus on winning elections, just not – these other kinds of elections mm-hmm. where where these big meta issues are going to come up. These local races, you don't have to argue with them about foreign policy. You don't have to argue with them about the Federal Reserve if you don't want to because those issues don't even come up. Right. But, but when they do come up, then I say if we're not going to speak like libertarians, then we should just forget it. And, and there I run into the so-called, oh, heaven help us, pragmatist caucus of the Libertarian Party where if they just couldn't be more excited to have some retired Republican governor. You know, right. running for you know, who's just using them for now? Not now. I wouldn't say that about Gary Johnson, but but some they want some you know retired politician who then will wipe his feet and go on back to the Republican Party, which has mm-hmm. happened a couple of times now, and that just has no appeal to me whatsoever. And the bizarre thing about this, Jordan, is that these very people who tend to be my biggest critics, these people tend to have leftist cultural sympathies, and and yet. When push comes to shove, they're the ones who want to vote for Republicans. Republicans turned libertarian. They're the ones who make the Libertarian Party look like it's just for disgruntled Republicans. They, not me, not the fuddy-duddy uh, right-wing bourgeois guy with five daughters. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm the one who wants to vote for the radical Libertarian candidate. They want this stuffed shirt from the Republican Party. It's like they're – do you not understand who you're supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be in this situation? Do you think that the problem is the sort of focus on outcomes 
versus the focus on principles. Because I feel like if we are focusing on natural rights, if we're focusing on uh, you know, property rights and uh, liberty generally, I feel like there can't be too many disagreements. If we all have the same sort of uh, Lockean, Notzikian framework of thinking about what the state is allowed to do, shouldn't we, even if you believe in gay marriage and, and I don't, or I do and you don't, or whatever, or I don't like smoking pot but think you should be allowed to do it, shouldn't we be able to just come together on the central principles? <laughs> of course. Of course we should. And the funny thing was that during the Ron Paul years, I'm not talking about the Libertarian Party necessarily, but people who incline philosophically in that direction did precisely that because we were so th thrilled and fascinated to be living through a period of time where young college students would chant, end the Fed. Uh, we couldn't believe this was happening really. And it caused people of varying backgrounds to come together and just get along. And I still have – and now that has – that has really, really changed mm -hmm. over the past uh, five years or more, where we've, you know, kind of broken into warring camps. There was much, much less of that, and we loved each other, and and we would say, you know, and we would even joke about it, you know, here's my crazy hippie friend over here, and they'd say, yeah, you know, here's my boring old nerd friend. <laughs> but what we loved was that all we wanted was a society where you're free to be a hippie, I'm free to be a nerd, and. You know where we have where we change the foreign policy, we change the monetary policy, we decentralize, we you know we we take power out of the hands of of what people we consider to be sociopaths, and we have a happier life. And that was what we thought we were working toward, and we were so thrilled to see that we had a spokesman who was totally unrehearsed, who was not the world's most uh, you know captivating public speaker in the traditional sense, but he was captivating rather in the sense of this guy's actually authentic. He hasn't actually focus grouped one sentence of this whole speech. <laughs> right. I did not know such a phenomenon existed, and so you couldn't look away. Right. And yeah, you're right. In principle, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to to pull this off. But these days, unfortunately, uh, and I was I was fearful of this that without you know libertarians like to say, oh, we don't need a leader because we're all individualists. Yeah, 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 yeah. But without that center of gravity. We've gone off in so many different directions, and different directions are okay, but when they're warring factions, oh, that's just a stupid waste of everybody's time. I, I don't want to do it, but when they start it, I finish it. I mean, that's basically how I was raised. Don't you start with people, but if somebody starts with you, you finish it. Well, thank you so much for joining the program, Tom. Uh, keep waking up every day and doing what you're doing because it's fantastic. And where can my listeners um, interact with you? My podcast is at tomspodcast.com, and you should subscribe on iTunes. You'll get a lot of great episodes. But what I'm known for almost as much as the podcast is something people are going to recoil from, and that is my email newsletter. They're going to say, oh, I get so much email already. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's something special about the Woods newsletter. I mean, mm. I mean I, 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 there are a lot of things I'm not good at at all, and I will openly admit it. But one thing I've gotten pretty good at is, is an email newsletter that people look forward to getting. I agree with it, that. It's a zinger. I mean, it's a zinger, and you're going to enjoy it. And to get on that, I actually, I actually bribe you a little bit. I have an ebook, Bernie called, Sanders, right? Oh, I have, I have an ebook called Bernie Sanders is Wrong, and you can go to <laughs> BernieIsWrong.com and pick that up, and you'll get on my list. Another way to get on my list is I have an ebook of, of uh, professors who went through the ringer, the, who stood up to the PC mob and lived to tell the tale, and you're going to love hearing their stories. And I put them together in an ebook called Think for Yourself, and the subject line is something like, you know, professors who resisted the mob tell their stories. And that is over at againstthemob.com. And that likewise will put you on my list. And you'll also enjoy and if all you want is the ebook, you can get the ebook and then just unsubscribe from my list. But don't do that because you're going to be <laughs> depriving yourself of one of life's pleasures. I agree. Again, thank you so much. It was great talking with you and I hope you'll consider coming on sometime in the future. And uh, uh, once again, uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye-bye.